So, for my first talk at CPPCon, I would have rather have a smaller room with a more intimate uh, lot of people, but uh, still I'm glad you are there, and thanks to the uh, piano guy, I was able to relax listening to uh, French film uh, music, so that's okay. We are gone for one hour speaking about compilers, zero-cost abstraction, and what you can tell about it. So first, uh, let me introduce myself. So I'm Serge, and I'm working as an R&D engineer at Quarks Lab. Quarks Lab is a security firm, small one, based in France, and I'm basically building an obfuscating compiler for C and C++ based on LLVM there. And I also happen to be an associate researcher in a French university, or and the author of Python to C++ compiler called Python, but uh, who cares? Um, one thing when you're working in a security firm is that you're surrounded by reverse engineers, which is not something I, I was used to. And when you are surrounded with reverse engineers, you happen to look at a lot of binary code. Those guys are reading the binary code and trying to reverse it without having the source code, and I am writing the source code, and so in the end, they happen to develop some more C++ skills, and I happen to look at more at the code generated by the compiler. And that was one of the origin of this talk, uh, looking at what the compiler is really doing from our high-level abstraction. Uh, another reason why I'm giving this talk is I happen to be the peon for Joël Falcou when he's teaching C++ in France, sometimes. And every now and then he says, at that point, the compiler will do this. And while he is talking, I just verify, and sometimes, well, you know, everybody knows that the compiler is doing something, but everybody knows that a sentence that begins with everybody knows uh, does not always end the way you want. So, um, there is this famous quote, C++ generates so little garbage. Well, it doesn't really give tribute to the important guy here, because the language is not responsible for generating anything. It just states the grammar, the things you are supposed to, to do, but there is nothing that states, from this specification, you must have efficient code, right? So, C++ is a nice language because it makes it possible for a compiler to generate little garbage. You can compare this to Python. Python is my favorite garbage collected language because it makes it very hard for a compiler to generate no garbage. It's still possible, but it's difficult, right? And it's easier, but still difficult from C++. And the thing we like, one of the things we like about C++ is, is this costless abstraction, zero overhead. We've been here hearing this a lot. Um, you can build complex software and in the end still have efficient assembly without adding cost. No, there is no free lunch, so there is a cost. But the fact is that you don't pay the cost at runtime because you have a bunch of people that are paying the cost writing the compilers. And those people suffer so that your code don't <laughs> suffer, right? So you don't pay it in the execution time, but you pay it in the complexity of the language, right? And you pay it in the complexity of the compiler. But who cares, because you're not paying it in the end. Uh, a good example about this is Constexp. So great, you can write this completely dumb code with a recursive function that will um, be computed at compile time. And it's perfectly okay, right? The static asserts make sure the, uh, the constness is respected. And if you compile, compile this with version of Clang, you get almost one second of compilation time, right? And then you remove the const and the static asset and you just print the output and then you have an execution time of three seconds. So Fibonacci executed its um, three milliseconds and compiled with constructs is almost one second. So 
this means that the compiler is paying the cost in compilation time, and you don't pay it at runtime. But it is paying more compiling than it would if it had gener generated the binary, run it, and then get the result. Because if you have a look at how Constex is implemented, you can, for example, try to change here the 26 value to 27. And if you do this, because this is a recursion of Fibonacci, you end up doing a lot of things, you got an error. Not because the static assert is false, but because evaluation hit maximum step limit is rich. What does it mean? It means that Clang, in that case, is in fact an interpreter for the C++ language that interprets the whole stuff so that you can have your fancy context thing. So the cost for the compiler guy is just rewrite an interpreter for the C++ language. And that's huge. But in the end, you don't pay the cost because you have no execution time. Okay, let's see the balance. So uh, in all this example, I will be using Clang as a f uh, the front end and LLVM as the middle end. Uh, if you followed several talks this week, you're already used to the LLVM bit code. If you're not, well, you can see it as a decorated SSA C code. But that's really an abstraction. Um, and here a disclaimer. All the things I have been using have been tested on my laptop with a rather old Clang version on a Linux laptop on AMD 64. And there is absolutely no guarantee that this will be reproducible in another compiler, in another target, on anything. Which leads me to a very bad property of C++. There is no guarantee that you will get optimized. You just cross fingers that the compiler will understand what you want, you can check, but there is very few uh, guarantee in the standard, right? So here I will not be giving any uh, golden rule, you have to do this because this can be optimized by the compiler, because it would be lying. This compiler can, on this configuration, can optimize things, right? And what we are going to see in the rest of the talk is just hints, about what kind of situation, what kind of abstraction a compiler may understand. But it's a may, it's not a must. So first abstraction, functions. Very important piece of any code. So can be used for various stuff, giving a name to a block of code just as some piece of documentation, avoiding redundancy, abstract some behavior with respect to the types, thanks to overloading. Still, we're using it a lot in C++. But it has a price, because when you do a function call, the first thing you do is save all the register, and then jump to the function code, perform your stuff, and then jump back and restore. So it costs you something. And it's really used a lot in the STL. For example, when you do STD copy, so that's for the GNU STL. Um, one possible call stack would be to call copy, then copy move A2, then copy move A, then copy move, and then in the end the built-in mem move, depending on the tray, depending on the kind of pointer you've been using, depending on the size also. But this is a possible call stack, and you don't want to pay the cost every time. So one of the most useful optimization, I think that if I had to quote two optimization of compilers that helps in C++, it's inlining and constant folding. So inlining, everybody knows, you've got here a bunch of functions, a member function, a function, and they are just adding one here, adding one here, and then they are called here, and if you call it with a decent compiler, in the end, the bit code you will get is just an add from the parameter with a constant, all the call stack has disappeared. And that's what you expect. Without this, you would not be able to do this specialization stuff that end up calling built-in mem move when you're calling std copy. Very important piece of optimization. But then, how do you control this? Because you can't trust the compiler, you have to take control. There is this inline hint. Inline hint is 
an int. So it's not, do this, maybe please do this. The only guarantee you have is uh, linking parts. When you do inlining, the one definition rule apply, but then you have no guarantee. If you want to take some more control, you can play with the flag, so it's compiler specific, but in Clang, you can pass these two flags, saying that if this threshold is higher, it should inline more functions. And here you can see that the int is still useful because it has a different um, flag, specific flag. But if you really want to take control, then you have to rely on non-standard extension, but this is supported by GCC and Clang, and you mark your function always in line, and it will try it be its best. But if it's a recursive function, it will not inline it. It's always in line if it's possible, but without any uh, cost-related thing. So, so far, so good for inlining. Then I will run through a bunch of small function-related code. So here, that's the value semantic stuff. You have two different ways of updating f. You can either pass it as a reference here or return the new value and manage the updating as a call site. Two different ways of doing things. Some people will say the golden rule is to always pass by value. And so the golden rule is always to pass by reference. I will just check on my setup. I have highlighted the important part. The first function here is the reference, and you can see that at the LLVM level, there is no more any reference. But yeah, I have been removing some extra attributes so that it's easier to read, but you have some guarantees that this reference actually is the referenceable for eight bits, but that's not the point of this example. You will do a load to get the value into the, from the pointer, and then the store to update the reference, right? So that's different from the scalar version, where you just add and return, right? So there is an extra memory manipulation when you do reference. So you could remember, reference do have a cost. That's an abstraction you get, but they may have a cost. Let's go on. This is more trollistic. Um, constref or not constref. Here it's an int, and sometimes people say, always constref so that I don't have to think which usually is not a good thing. But, um, and here I've just marked it as no inline so that the compiler will not do something I don't want it to do, and I'm calling it from a column function. Note that here, function is marked static, okay? There is an importance. I compile it with minus O2, and while well, not that surprising, I still get my pointer, so I have to load the value and then return it, and for the value semantic, I just get the value and return it. So, constraint or not constraint. But with minus of three, I end up with the very same function, because he realized that the pointer stuff is not useful here, but there is an issue. I have changed the API of my function, and I'm not allowed to do this because Someone may be using it in another translation unit. Oh no, it's okay, it was static. So that may be one of the hints I would give is when you put something in an anonymous namespace or when you put it no, in a private namespace or if you put your function as static, then you're giving more information to the compiler. And this information can be used to perform more optimization. So on that example, well, constraint or not constraint, doesn't care. But well, usually you're passing high-level packed objects, structures, classes as constraint to avoid the cost of copying the whole object there. So here I have uh, some things that could be your RGB structure, and I'm performing the, the average and passing in as constraint, which is something I'm supposed to do. And here, it's static. And just to show the difference, on the second function, I'm calling the previous one, but this one is not static, right? And there is several interesting things that happened. So first, but we are now used to this, you say, okay, it's static, so I can manage to change 
the layout or the number of arguments. So there is no longer one structure type, but it has some kind of inlined the structure into uh, the parameters, which it's, is okay because I don't have to load from the, from the structure because it's already loaded at the call site and then I can perform my computation. This looks a lot like passing by copy instead of passing by const reference. And if I have a look to the assembly code, then a lot of things have happened. That's a second hint. Looking at the bit code is not always enough because something can happen at the back end. I have my two function. This one is a uh, exported one, and this one is a static one, so you can see here there is a bunch of instructions that are related to the original one. But from the previous one, I am first doing a bunch of move, so that's loading from the construct. But I have to load them because I can't change the signature of this function. But once I have loaded everything, I'm jumping, so I'm not making a call. The function was marked as inline, so I'm making a tail call, which basically avoids copying registers before doing the jump, and then I do my regular function. So a lot, lot of things have happened there. So thanks to the compiler. Another abstraction you get is, uh, or technique you can use is tag dispatching test dispatching to have different behavior depending on a parameter that is not actually used in the computation, but just used to change the signature of your function. So different behavior, different types, but you could say, well, I'm using an additional parameter, so maybe an additional register, maybe it will increase the register pressure and maybe lead to register spilling or whatever. This may sound like less optimized. So let's have a look to what happened. Again, my, my, my function were marked as static. It's static, whoa, the parameter has disappeared. But that's the same name. If you don't have different parameters, then that's the same function name. No, it's not because of the mangling. So the difference between the two functions is already done here at the name level. So we don't really need the type, the extra parameter anymore. So there is no cost in using tag dispatching for static functions. Then this marvelous lambdas. I'm not quite sure uh, I'm supposed to write something like this, storing a lambda in a pointer, but uh, it actually works here because I have no uh, capture. Two different way of declaring a function one good way and one bad way, but uh, who cares about this? So that, the interesting thing is that I have the very same code in the end. The only difference is that a lambda doesn't have a name, but it needs to have a name at the uh, compiler level, so there is this generating name with a magnificus dollar that just wrecks havoc in the highlighting of the code. Uh, but that's the same function, so I could say there is no overhead using anonymous function in place of named function. Or in the other hand, adding a name to a function doesn't have any overhead. But uh, lambda are really interesting for their capture feature. So here I'm doing something, I, I have some difficulties to explain the generated bit code, but I will try. This is a function that generates a function that performs an addition with a captured value or a multiplication with a constant. What would you expect as a signature for a bar from a compiler point of view? My first guess was, well, it returns a type related to the function. And for foo, it will return some kind of structure like a structure function and that would work. But actually, that's not the case at all. Bar returns void. So, like my lambda has disappeared, it doesn't return the function or whatever. But if we have a look at foo, then we begin to understand. 
foo returns an int. And that's exactly the closure, the captured parameter. So what it does is, at the call site, the function will be there, the return function, but it's just a type. It's not a value. The value is its state. So you return the state, and at the call site, you know that you've got your function, and you can use this state to run your function. But that was funny to see how it's represented um, by LLVM. I don't know if GCC used the same um, approach. I would assume yes, because otherwise there would be some ABI incompatibility, but I'm not sure. Uh, second high-level piece of abstraction, you've got your functions and you've got your data. And data are associated to structs and classes, so they are used to box things, box values into types so that you can associate some processing to your type, associating processing to the data, manage the lifetime, and so on. Well, that's a piece of abstraction we are relying on. So we are boxing value. Uh, there is this famous test, the Stepanov test that gave his name to a famous password. And I will just check what happens here. We've got two kinds of boxing. Boxing through a structure or through inheritance. And here I'm allocating a new object and I assume that it will create this scope and this scope. Let's have a look. First, it's allocating some raw memory. The interesting thing here is that you get to understand how a constructor is called at the bit call level. So get, first you get your raw memory, and then you, you do your, this kind of placement new, like I'm storing some value into this memory, the bitcasts are here to manage the raw memory converted to the real types and then assign the first character and then the second character with some memory moving. This one I can't really explain because it's storing first a zero and then on that very place storing this character and the eight bits afterwards this character. Quite strange. If we have a look at the generated assembly, there is still this at the very same location, first storing zero, and then not storing the first character and the second, but storing the packed value. So maybe someone in the audience knows why we have to store this here. Maybe to zero, because Rx can hold more than 16 bits. So maybe to zero this and then store, but I'm not quite sure, so I won't tell. Um, some more boxing and unboxing. Here you have a struct with a struct with a struct, so a nested struct hierarchy, hierarchy, and then individually setting the values. What happened? You would expect something like setting the first value, setting the second value, as in the previous example. But in the end, you realize that these all are integers, so Instead of using this complex type, we can just use an int of 48 bits and begin to store value, but instead of storing value in the first bits and so on, we can do some computation just to avoid storing too much. And that's why you've got this shift left and or operation instead of just moving data because computation is supposed to be less expensive than uh, memory operation. So it's not only unboxing stuff, it's also merging representation when it's possible. Then you've got member functions. Member functions, are there a good abstraction? Should you write functions that take the structure as first parameter or not? Well, surprisingly enough, a member function is very Pythonic because the compiler sees this as a function with the this parameter as first parameter. So there is really no difference between a member function and a function that takes the object as first parameter. And then you call your stuff. That really doesn't matter. So just like the self in Python. Makes me happy. This example tries to showcase what happens when you do a copy. 
that's the default copy constructor. I have a very large object here. I first initialize one global one and then perform a copy from the parameter to the global one. There's no point in doing this in a real situation, but for, for, the, for here it's okay. First, this is a global variable, so it's default initialized with a bunch of zero. And that's flagged here. And then, whoa, wait, the C guy would be happy because I didn't write anything specific here, but something that looks like a mem copy appeared. So that's not the C mem copy, right? That's a LLVL built in that abstracts the mem copy behavior with respect to the different types that I don't really understand, by the way, here. And then it's up to the backend to select, I guess, during the lowering to select do I have to call a mem copy? Can I just use an unrolled loop? But the copy constructor happens to be recognized as an idiom that can be optimized later. So that's a good news. That's one exception to the no standard, no guarantee in the standard. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, copy elision is, is to ha be happening. It's written in the standard. So copy elision is that uh, here, I don't have to copy my object at the call site. I can just use the one that I returned. And two version. Here, it's returned without giving it a name. And here, I give it a name and then I return it. And in fact, by design, copulation is respected because when you return a value that is not a scalar but a complex object, then instead of passing it a, as a return parameter, you pass it as a function parameter with a special attribute here, the sret, which flag it as this is a return value. And so you don't have to care will there be a copy or not because the object is already created at the call site and you just fill stuff in. Right, so copy elision works uh, by design. And if you use a temporary, well, it just doesn't matter you've got the exact very same code. Then, virtual metal codes. Hot topic. So here I've got my interface and I implement it in A and for the purpose of this example, I mark the do it function method here as final and I'm calling this do it method either through the interface or through the actual object. So my foo and bar function are not static, so the compiler can't make any guess. So not very surprisingly, there will be a cost here. And you've got these v tables that happen. So the, here, instead of, well, first, here it's final. So I know that this it will be this function that is called and it gets in line and everything works. And here I have to look into the internals of my structure to get the vtable pointer and then access to the actual function pointer, which is why here, instead of calling a function, I call something that is in a register, so I have an indirect call, and I do pay for this. But there is nothing the compiler can do here because, well, uh, the interface has no reason to be implemented only by A. So I pay for the vtable. But in some simple case, and maybe in more complex case, but uh, I've not explored this, here I'm telling the compiler, well, I have my original object A, but I see it through its interface before calling it, right? And as it's through the interface, the vtable may be involved, but hopefully it's not because, well, it's just, in this scope, I can know the real type, so I don't have to perform a dynamic lookup for the type. And so it's devirtualized and it can be inlined. Just one word. What costs here is not only the fact that you have to look for the function, but the real cost is that as you don't know the function, you can't inline it. And remember, inline is one of the keystone of optimization for C++. 
and Bitable just destroys this. But sometimes uh, it doesn't matter. Then I have this free for all section where several stuff from the C++ language or from the standard template library, uh, some controversial one, and just have a look to what happens from a compiler point of view. Initializer list. That's at global scope, and I've created two objects. One is an std array and one is a std vector. They are initialized the same, but they may have a different life afterwards. In which section would you think this goes to? In the text section, in the code section, in the data section, in the read-only section? Same question here, in the final binary. Let's have a look first as OLLVM sees this. This is my array. It's a global and it's initialized statically. So there is strong chance that this will go to the data section, uh, speaking about the ELF format. So that's nice. There will be no overhead at startup because everything is already in, a, um, in the binary, in the good section. But things get worse with vector. The global value is zero initialized, I don't care. This is an extract from the ELF constructor. The ELF constructor is uh, the function that gets, initial, uh, that gets called before the main, or if you're using a shared library, when your library is loaded first, all these things happen, and then you actually run your code. So before you're the main, you will initialize your vector, which is what you expect because it was global, but you initialize it by storing every single value one after the other. So here the loop has been unrolled, maybe with a larger initializer list. Uh, no. Uh, one thing I would have expect is maybe put this data into the data section, or in the arrow data, and do a copy, but that's not what happens. So there is a slight overhead using a CD vector there, because you pay at runtime for the static initialization of your vector. Then, this auto. Some C guy would say, hmm, auto looks like magic, so if I want to be sure, I write my indexes. So the thing that happened is what I have been asking for. Let's have a look. That's a bit of complex code. That's the inner loop. You've got something that takes care of the induction variable, the fee stuff, but you just have to count. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, and a branch. That's the auto version. And here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plus a branch. So the index, loop indexing, the loop indexing through a scalar actually generates one more instruction at the LLVM bit code level then the auto one. Why? Because of the highlighted stuff here. When you iterate with auto, you're iterating through the iterators, so through the pointers, and so the induction variable of your loop is also the place where you will store the data. But when you are using an additional index, then you still have to move to the pointer, so you still have this pointer that does the induction, plus one integer that also performs the induction. So you have two, um, two variables that do basically the same stuff, right? So this may increase, I don't know, maybe uh, the register pressure. It certainly doesn't have any impact on the performance in the end. But still, high level, low level, but low level does not mean you're doing it good. Low level means that you can do at the low level everything that you can do at the high level, but you can also do bad things that you would not do at high level because uh, you don't even think about this. Then indexing a vector. Very simple. 
you just call the this operator compared to indexing a pointer. I'm not advocating for using pointers everywhere instead of vector, right? It's just a matter of comparing the stuff. And not very surprisingly, there is an additional instruction when you index for a vector. Because you first have to access in the vector the pointer. And then from the pointer, you, you can go index the real data. While if you only have the pointer, you access the data. So you have an extra indirection that says, from my class, I have to go to the actual pointer. But most of the time, if you're indexing, you're into the loop, and this extra differencing will be moved outside of the loop, or might be moved outside of the loop, and so you don't care, you, you end up with the same loop body. But still, there is, from a compiler point of view, this extra small overhead that doesn't matter most of the time. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised by the behavior of Clang on this one. Can I remove the new delete pair? Yes. Yeah. Oh no. Mm, what's, what's the job of a compiler? Generating a code that has the same behavior semantic as the one explained. If I run out of memory here and I do a new, what's the behavior? I've got an exception or a crash depending on setup. But if I remove the new, then I no longer have my crash. And that's something, uh, that's an observable behavior, a crash. And actually Clang removes the pair, just doing the regular operation, but GCC doesn't. Right, so I don't know about the standard, uh, I just find it funny. <laughs> Uh, a few words about exceptions. There is this no except keyword. Does it help? If I don't put it everywhere, what happens? Here, I'm cheating a bit because there is no static. So I can't change the, the signature of the function, but still, so I am trying to call both. I know nothing about their code because it's not in this translation unit and I may happen to catch it to just refill the information. First thing, just have a look at the declaration of the function. Bar and foo both have some attributes. I removed all the attributes on the previous example, but here it's important because this, there is this extra attribute, no unwind. No accept means no unwind, which means I don't have to register my function in a special place so that uh, the unwinding stuff can go well. And that's not the case for the second. So there is an impact. I will not be registered in this special variable. And when I do my call, the first function, remember, no accept, there is a call, or it happens to be a tail call, but a regular call. For foo, it's not a call, it's an invocation, like uh, Magic the Gathering, you're invoking something. And which basically mean call this, and if everything goes well, go to this label. But if something goes wrong, and we don't know because we don't have any exception specification, then begin to unwind, and then bad things may happen. Well, in fact, I have never understood exception on in LLVM, I just try to avoid generating this kind of setup, <laughs> but um, it happens to be processed differently by the compiler and it does generate a bunch of code. So it's not a myth that if you go this way in the unwinding, then you're paying a lot, right? Because there's a lot of code executing. A final one, uh, in my, uh, one of my previous life, uh, well, I'm not that old, but still. Um, I was doing HPC and there was this number crunching routine and you don't use C++ for this because, well, you know, C++, you don't control anything. I've just been writing the outer product the very dumb way, even using indexes, right? And I compile this with minus 03 
minus arc equal native. And I will spare you all the outer loops, but in the inner loops, LVM does recognize that you can use SEMD instruction because you have this vector form of the floating point multiplication. But that's good news. I don't have to care on simple example about vectorization. I get a free abstraction of my hardware. The compiler happens to, to understand it. Or in real life, uh, like signal processing, uh, the automatic vectorizer can't do its job on many algorithm uh, scheme, but on this one, it's okay. So, the bring home message. The only thing you have to remember, because I, I told you that there won't be any golden rule, is that uh, we do love compiler, compilers, because uh, they are responsible for uh, the, the free abstraction. They do their jobs, and so we can do ours, which is just engineering, software engineering, and not uh, compiler engineering. But as they help us, when someone helps you, uh, you have to communicate with him, right? Uh, so, have a look to the info page of GCC, have a look to the manual help of Clang, and there's a plenty of flags that you can use to tweak the way you communicate with him. Most of them are, some of them are portable, some of them are not, but still, it's important. And then you don't, you can't trust, really trust the compiler. It's not because I've showed you that uh, inlining works, that uh, initializer, initializer lists are okay with STD arrays, that it will always be the case, right? It's, it should be the case, but there is no guarantee. So it's nice to be able to verify the codes, the generated codes and generated by codes, the assembly. When you're in doubt, uh, the source is just the input. You have to have a look to the generated parts. And then a bunch of thanks because for the, the people that helped me to improve on the high level are Joel and Pierrick and the friends from Quarks Labs that helped me improve at the lower level and all around thanks from my firm for letting me talk in here and CPPCon for making it possible to talk. I guess we have plenty of time, so plenty of time for question. Yes? I'm actually curious about the cost of registration uh, for the exception. So when you're uh, like doing the no accept, you make the function call, and you, and you actually so you register, what kind of costs do you see there? I think, oh, so the question is, uh, I told you that if you don't use no accept, then there is some registration of the function in a particular structure. And what is this cost? I think it's a compile time. Uh, it's, um, the function is registered in a global variable. And so that's, there may be a space cost, but not a runtime cost. Yes? So, uh, if I understand well the question, the question is, uh, should you just remove the inline keywords everywhere? Um, the only place where I've seen inline useful is really for this one definition rule. I mean, if you put a function in the header, then you have to mark it inline so that you don't get a linking issue. But as an int, like you're in the, you have a static function in your translation unit, uh, I generally don't put it in line, and it's so we always. So. Uh, so. Repeated question is, 
Uh, anyway, there is link time optimization. So are all this inline and static stuff important? Um, so first, link time optimization from what, so there are in LLVM two kind of link time optimization. There is a, a you pay for all and thin link time optimization that only takes care of some optimization like inlining and constant folding and that gathers some summary of each function before doing the actual stuff instead of load, because um, the link time optimization that costs you a lot is you take all your translation units, put them in a single big translation unit and then run. So if you do this, and there is a main, so it's not, and if it's not a shared library, then you know that no symbol has to be exported, so everything is static. And at that point, I think that inline is not relevant and even static. Uh, and then you don't have to worry that much about things being static or not. Uh, if you're in your shared library, then the static keyword is still important because uh, it controls what you export. But uh, I would be more worried about static or not with respect to link time optimization than inline or not. Yes? I think the difference is that, so the question is any difference between static and uh, anonymous namespace. And the difference is that um, in an anonymous namespace, if you declare a class with inline uh, methods, then they get static and you can't put this in, in, uh, for a static function. I think there is not. Any other question? Yeah. In what situations can it uh, optimize a call by reference into a call by value on a class? In what situation can a callback value be optimized? In what situations can a class method have the pass by reference be optimized into pass by value? In what situation? Yeah, like, like for a global function, you showed that it needs to be static because if it's external, then it's mm -hmm. I think that class members are not static at all. Are static like um, local to the translation unit. So you have to put them in a private namespace, in an anonymous namespace. And otherwise, they are part of the API. Mm, but maybe that if your type does not ex escape from the translation unit, then it's okay. But uh, I'm not sure what I'm telling you. I have to check, which is the whole point of this talk. Yes? So the question is somehow related to a previous question that do I have any uh, experience in how does link time optimization affect uh, any of the examples I have shown where uh, static, where I'm, I had to mark function static or not. And my guess about this is that if you're uh, compiling into a binary and not into a shared library, then you can assume that everything is from, a, from the link time optimizer, then everything is static which means that you don't have to worry anymore about respecting the API, except if you have uh, taken the address of the function and passed it. But, um, and if you are building a shared library, then the API stuff are still valid, and then it still matters. Okay, no other question? So let me thank you again.